Assalamu alaikum. It's lovely to see you all here. It's a lovely summer's day. I'd just like to welcome you all to this session on a woman's journey to Islam. And we have some wonderful, honored guests with us today. Uh, and what I'm going to do is just introduce them. They'll each um, have a turn to say their journeys. And then, inshallah, at the end, we'll have um, some question and answers. I'm sure you've got lots of questions for, for our guests. Uh, I'd like to start with Yvonne Ridley. As many of you know, she's a journalist who came into great prominence in September um, 2001 when she was held hostage by the Taliban um, for 11 days while she was a journalist with the Daily Express. And they let her go, thankfully. And, uh, and she converted to Islam. It's been a very prominent figure. She is a presenter on Islam Channel. Um, and inshallah, I'll let her tell the rest of her story. Brothers, sisters, friends, assalamu alaikum. Before 9-11, I used to have a very fixed view of Islam. Thankfully, I have moved on, but unfortunately, most of my friends in the Western media haven't. They usually write about cultural issues like child brides, female circumcision, honor killings, and forced marriages. These are issues that are simply not specific to Islam and have nothing to do with Islam, and yet they still write about them and then go on to blame Islam. In fact, today, several sisters have stopped me and they've been very hurt about an article in The Independent, written by a non-Muslim woman who says that she doesn't like the niqab. It frightens her. Well, drunken football hooligans wearing the English shirt frighten me, but I'm not calling on us to ban them. However, the reality is that um, I knew very, very little about Islam, and so I began looking into various aspects. It was a deal that I cut with my captors. I said to the Taliban, if you let me go, I will read the Quran and study Islam. And that is what I did. And what I found out was breathtaking. The reality is that Islam came on the scene. When Islam came on the scene, women were treated as inferior beings beforehand. In fact, we still have a problem of this in the West where men think that they are superior. This is a legacy to the days of the so-called Great British Empire and European colonialism. There was an active policy of the colonialists to keep women down. By keeping them down in a lowly second-class position and by encouraging the oppression of them, it meant that half the population would be written off as a threat. That would leave just the other half of the population to oppress the men. Of course, the colonialists talked about how barbaric Islam was and how civilized Europe was. It was a mantra which was chanted many times a day over the centuries, and we can still hear it in some corners. The ruling elite, the boss class, still continue to promote the lie. And as I started looking, I went back into the history and, and began to realize what was uh, going on. Then I started looking closely at the Muslim community. And there are Muslims who do continue to promote the idea that old radical Islam oppresses, whereas what is really needed is modern Islamic thought. Having read the Quran and supporting literature, and as a new Muslim to Islam, I regard the modernizers as the enemy within. They promote Western thought while often dressing in Muslim clothes. I would have continued to think like that if it weren't for the trauma, as I say, of my arrest by the Taliban. During my captivity, the only hope I felt I had of getting out was cutting this deal to read the Quran. The Quran Reading, I thought, would be a very simple academic exercise. And to make it more interesting, when I started, I began cherry-picking all the women's issues. But I couldn't find any chapters on how to oppress women or how to beat your wife or how to subjugate your daughter. 
What I found instead shocked me, and then I realized that I had been lied to because the Quran makes it crystal clear that women are equal in spirituality, education, and worth. A woman's gift for childbirth and child rearing is recognized as a quality and an attribute. Furthermore, the Prophet, peace be upon him, said that the most important person in the home was the mother, the mother, the mother. In fact, he also said that the feet of the mother were in paradise. I then began looking at inheritance, tax, property, and divorce laws, and I realized this is from where Hollywood divorce lawyers probably get their inspiration. Isn't it funny the way the tabloid media gets so excited when some pop stars decide to get married and they, they bring in teams of lawyers to draw up prenuptial wedding agreements. Muslim women have had wedding contracts from day one. Just about everything that feminists strived for in the 70s was already available to Muslim women 1400 years ago. Islam dignifies and brings respect to motherhood and being a wife. If you want to stay at home, stay at home. It is a great honor, in fact, to be a homemaker and the first educator of your children. In fact, the hand that rocks the cradle is probably the hand that rules the world because I really firmly believe that the mother is the first educator, the greatest influence in any home. The mother is the madrasa. But equally, the Quran states, if you want to work, work. Be a career woman, learn a profession, become a politician. Be what you want to be and excel in it because everything you do as a Muslim is in praise of Allah. So everything that you do, whether it's at work or in the home, you should give it 100% for Allah. There is an excessive, almost in, ir irritating concentration on the focus of Muslims, uh, Muslim women's dress, particularly by men. My clothes do not define my identity as a Muslim. How can a piece of cloth make me a better person? Yes, it is an obligation for Muslim women to dress modestly, but there are many, many important issues which should also concern Muslim women today. And yet everyone obsesses over the hijab. Look, it's part of my business suit. This cloth on my head tells you I am a Muslim woman, therefore I expect to be treated with respect. Can you imagine if someone told a Wall Street executive or a banker in the square mile that he should chill out and put on a t-shirt and a pair of jeans because he'd be much more comfortable. He would say, how dare you? This business suit defines me as a person and I want to be treated seriously. Islam provides women with a blueprint for life and it is as relevant today as it was 1400 years ago. It's extremely sophisticated and I found that reading the Quran requires a great deal of intellect and yet it is so simple that a child can understand it and that is the miracle of our holy book and Islam. I also discovered that there is not a woman who will go to the hellfire simply because she is a woman. Superiority in Islam is accomplished through piety, not beauty, wealth, power, position or sex. Now you tell me what is more liberating, being judged on the length of your skirt and the size of your bust or being judged on your character, mind and intelligence. As I was reading this, <laughs> as I was reading this, I couldn't believe it. I thought, why have I got such a bad view of Islam? As my daughter grows up, I want her to be respected for who she is and not what she wears. But more importantly, I want her to respect herself. And as my journey to Islam began, that is something that I learned, self-respect. Glossy magazines tell us as women that unless we are tall, slim, and beautiful, we will be unloved and unwanted. Islam tells me that I have a right to an education, and it's my duty to go out and seek knowledge whether I am single or married. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, clearly revered, adored, and admired women for their strengths and their weaknesses. He was a huge supporter of women's rights. Now allow me to read 
a small section of a speech from US politician Pat Robertson. This is a man who has the ear of the President of the United States. And this is what he thinks of empowered women. And then you tell me who is civilized and who is not. The Reverend Pat Robertson said, feminism encourages women to leave their husbands, kill their children, practice witchcraft, destroy capitalism, and become lesbians. Perhaps someone should tell Pat Robertson he is living in a pre-Islamic age, and he needs to modernize and civilize. I would say people like him are wearing a veil, and we need to tear that veil of bigotry away so that people can see Islam and its brothers and sisters as they really are. My journey to Islam took over 30 months. Some people revert to this great faith just on hearing the Azan. Others take many more years. We all go at our own speeds. But what I did do when I embraced Islam on June the 30th, 2003, at 11.30 in the morning, I embraced what I consider to be the biggest and the best family in the world. I really do. We're living in a very, very difficult age where Islam is being demonized, why, when our own people are being terrorized by a government, by institutions, by authorities who are looking at us in a strange way. Anyone wearing a hijab or a beard now is seen as an extremist. We are living in dangerous times, but we have to remember we belong to one great family. And what we have to tell the non-Muslims is that if you hurt one of us, you hurt all of us. Once they finally get this message, they will think twice about trashing our homes, shooting our innocent people, raiding um, dawn raids, and um, terrorizing Muslims. Once they get the message that we will no longer tolerate this terrorism in our community, they will back off. As I say, the day I embraced Islam was the day I belonged and joined a great family. And I would like to think that if I am ever in trouble or in need, brothers and sisters will come running to help me, just in the same way I feel I will go running to help them if they need me. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum.